Hello and welcome back to this discussion of our seventh shorts program in Currents. Uh, I'm here with uh, filmmakers Aya Koazoy, Jacqueline Lensu, uh, Sofia Bodinovic, uh, Femno Klan, and Graham Foy. Uh, and we're also joined by Aiko Masabuchi, who will assist with translation. Um, to start things off, I'd just like to say thank you all very much uh, for your films and uh, for allowing us to share them with our audience online this year. Um, uh, this program skews toward uh, narrative filmmaking perhaps more than the others uh, in this section, but I think, I think each of your films also pushes against or, or, or challenges our ideas of what to expect from a narrative short. Uh, they're all, I think, very moving deeply felt films, and but they're also quite internal and, and introspective. Uh, and I think there's a, a thread of thread of loneliness or and loss and, and belonging that I think extends across each of your films too. Uh, in fact, I think this idea of loss or the absence of something is actually quite central to each of your films, uh, whether they're, you know, they're memories or a sense of identity or, or place in the world or a loss of a loved one, uh, dreams or, or sleeplessness, uh, and perhaps uh, our confidence uh, in the future. Um, so maybe I, I'd like to, to ask all of you uh, a question. Uh, well, A, if, if you would agree with this assessment, uh, and if so, uh, B, uh, could you speak to how you thought about absence um, or loss cinematically? Uh, you know, in, in many ways, it's an occasion for a lot of other ideas to, to rear their heads in its place. Um, and I feel like, um, from my point of view, it could be quite an overwhelming condition to render on film. So um, I, any of you can chime in uh, about that. Okay. Um... I definitely agree with, uh, I haven't watched the rest of the films, unfortunately, apart from Lance's film. Um, however, yes, judging from my own short, um, it's a continuation on the study of um, loss. Uh, loss in a much more metaphorical way. Loss of meaning, loss of purpose, loss of calmness and internal peace. Uh, so that way, of course. And uh, I, I, again, I want to touch upon a, a particular word that you mentioned, which is belonging. Uh, my film discusses, in a way, in a weird way, in a way, uh, how a, a young woman does not feel she belongs anywhere. And as a solution, she imagines, okay, this is an open... Uh, topic in my film, she imagines or she finds out that she doesn't belong from here. So it makes sense that in a way uh, she doesn't feel connected to any of the surroundings. So I totally agree with what you said. And uh, I can't wait to watch the rest of the films and um, find out uh, loss and loneliness. I, th I think uh, I totally agree with, with what you're saying, Tyler, and maybe just thinking about how how it relates to August twenty second this year, um, I think I was I was it very much is is about I guess the loss of of a future or of the idea of the future, and I think in in lieu of that, the film very um, sort of actively tries to center itself around the present and sort of showcase what is at stake of being lost, I guess, in, in, in sort of the, the face of a mythical existential threat. Um, but I think in thinking about, in thinking about loss, it's sort of, as a, as a filmmaker, it sort of grounded me uh, in terms of my cinematic approach in, in, in a way that made me much more present in how I thought about filming these moments of life on sort of this last day uh, on earth. And, and, and it, I think it made its way into sort of the, the observational approach, sort of grounding each moment in, uh, in the present. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree with uh, your assessment of the, the program, Tyler. And I think that it's really hard to put a program together that is about absence and loss and grieving um, that, I, that has a lot of variation 
um, and that also um, I think is punctuated by really um, beautiful and uplifting moments and difficult ones. So I would say that you did a really good job of um, threading, I think, those themes together. I think, um, yeah, I really enjoyed watching the, the program. And in terms of the way that I uh, approached Point and Line to the Plane, um, for me, when my friend passed away, um, his death was so sudden and so um, shocking that for me, it was all about trying to, I guess, recreate his presence or to show this kind of like cobbling of like traces um, that I could find um, of him um, in my day to day. And I went through this period of magical thinking, um, which I was able to label after I read Joan Didion's book, The Year of Magical Thinking. And it's this term coined by Freud. And it's when someone passes away, your brain can't like put it all together. It just can't understand what's happening. And because that person is no longer in your life and you really want to continue that relationship or the conversations that you had, you look for signs and coincidences and meaning in your day to day to kind of continue that relationship because your mind and heart and body can't handle the loss. So I guess in the configuration of the film, I think my focus was really, um, on absence and this void and how I was trying to reanimate this relationship um, with my friend uh, after he passed away. Yeah, so uh, I'm agree with uh, Taylor and actually uh, I only watch uh, Jacqueline's films besides mine and uh, I am so very curious about the films of other filmmakers um, from like uh, how you deal with all this uh, topic. Um, uh, for me then, uh, because um, what I start from uh, the um, from this film is uh, like a uh, um, festival in Laos. Actually, last year they granted uh, uh, five filmmakers in uh, Southeast Asia a, a, a small grant to make short film about the Maker Weaver. And uh, uh, what what I start from the film is like uh, I, I try to imagine about the way that uh, like uh, how. Uh, the Mekong can, uh, the, the river can represent both in art and then in social life and then in uh, other things. And I realized that, the, uh, I, 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 like, we all know that um, uh, the Mekong always, uh, the river always be um, like a metaphor for the time, like um, like the flow of the time and things. And it's always happened when we have to, to deal with uh, like the past and the future of us, then we really have to deal with ourselves. So especially in this uh, time of the world when we really feel uh, like, kind of like loneliness and things. So it just happened very naturally. Uh, yeah, hi. I think it's a no, so 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 no, あの、急にいろんなものがなくなってしまう瞬間的になくなってしまうっていうことがあって、それを失うことにつながるとは思うんですけれど、その、まあ、その存在を揺るがす何かっていうものについて私の作品は作りました。so in terms of uh, loss and loneliness, in terms of my own work, um, it has a lot to do with how I think of the self and how the self exists. Um, so in making this film, I really thought about my own existence. And the thing with Japan is that there's a lot of disasters that can happen, including things like the tsunami that could su suddenly cause things to disappear. Um, and of course, that also leads to loss. And so in making this film, I was really thinking about what kind of things waver makes my own existence waver. Uh, thank you all for uh, those answers. Um, 
I, uh, I'll, I'll stick with you um, with your film Humongous. Um, it, it has a very, it has an elliptical shape where memories or, or perhaps their dreams uh, seem to open up into new ones and, and kind of fold back onto themselves. Um, and I'm curious how you got to that final point. Um, like when conceiving of the film, did you start, you mentioned maybe thinking about yourself and your own existence, but I'm, I'm curious if you started with an image or, or a word or a, a concept. えっと、その無限ま、um, so, uh, so basically, in terms of building the image of this film, um, I took a lot of inspiration um, and I was referencing uh, the performing art, Japanese performing arts, no, but specifically the kind uh, called Mugen no, which sort of Mugen means infinite, um, and no is the type of performing arts. Um, and what Mugen no is, is that it, uh, it's generally com composed of two people. It's a two people, uh, two protagonist format. And one of the protagonist is usually always a ghost or a spirit or a god. Um, and then the other protagonist is a human. Um, and the way that the, the dialogue is made in a way that it becomes very ambiguous as to whether the dialogue is speaking from a ghost perspective or a human perspective. Um, and also the dialogue uh, makes uh, time very ambiguous, whether it's set in the present or it's set in the past. Um, in terms of the protagonist that is human, uh, the human sort of represents a forward moving time um, as opposed to ghost time or spirit time is seen as more eternal. And the, the direction that the time flows is, um, it starts from this eternal time and coming into the present. And in this film, I was really thinking about these two voices and um, thinking about the point where these two times meet. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, as, you, as you put it, there's a kind of, well, I, I, I sort of thought of dream logic, but maybe there's a, a spiritual logic to it, um, to the structure and um, that jumps around um, at different points in time. Um, but I, and I think a lot of the transitions are prompted by, by sound, which seems to grow more intense as the film grows on, goes on. Um, so I, I'm curious how you uh, approach sound for the film um, and maybe to tag on to that question, a, a similar one would be, 
um, how you sort of thought of the, the film's color palette, uh, which I think also the blue hues add to um, this dreamlike indistinct quality. その日本の能の構成の仕方にもちろんその影響を受けてるんですけど私のその作品を作る上で全,全部に共通するのがその全部に共通するテーマがあの夢の中の登場人物は意識を持っているのかっていうことが一応テーマにあって自分が見てる夢に出てくるあの人は誰なんだろうっていうのが大きくテーマに。ありますので、あの夢の中というのは正しいと思い思います。えっと音響については、えー、そのまあ、とてつもなく大きなというタイトルにかかってくると思うんですが、あヒューマンガスっていうのはまあ、まあ、めっちゃでっかい、ね、何かの存在っていう意味でつけてるんですけれども、そのその大きな存在予感みたいなもの、それはその本当に神様でやったりとか。震災であったりとか災害であったりとかその予感を、まあ、何で表現するかその予感を感じ取ってしまった彼女は何に怯えてるのかっていうことで私はこの作品で音音,音による振動で、えっと、その予感というか自分よりも自分を凌駕してしまう存在を音で表現しましまたで、えっと、本当にこの作品はその劇場で描けることを想定しているので劇場ではそのかなりこう振動するように設計されていてあの体感としても予感振動としてこう受け取れるようにできたらなと思って、えーまあ、そういうふうに音響は構成しています。でまあ、色彩については、えっとまあ、そのこの作品の物語のインスピレーションになったのがそのちょっと長くなっちゃうんですけどあの震災のあった石巻でそのクジラの解体を見たことが、まあ、この物語の大きなインスピレーションになってしって、まあ、かなり圧倒的な生物が人間によって丁寧に解体されていく。そういった儀式的な要素を儀式的な様子を見て、えーまあ、この作品を作ろうと思ったんですけれどもだからおその最初のインスピレーションで海っていうものがあったのでそのフィルムを使う際にもその、まあ、外で使うならデイ,デイフィルムだと思うんですが、えっと、タングステンのフィルムを使って青く海の中にいるような色味にしています。以上です。すいません、長くて。So as I explained earlier,、uh, the this was inspired. The composition was definitely inspired by、uh, Japanese no.、Uh, but what is very present in all of the work that I make is that、um, one thing that I'm really always curious about is whether The protagonist of my dreams are conscious beings.、Um, and, if, and so I wonder often whether、um, who the people are in my dreams or in the dreams. And so, Tyler, you're correct when you say that there's a dreamlike quality to the film. It's something that's present in all my work.、Um, and in terms, of,、uh, the, uh, the, in terms of the title of my film, which is Humongous,、uh, it's really about. This film is also about something very big. And that big can be,、um, can perhaps be a spiritual thing. It could be God, but it could also be disasters、um, that are very big. And I really wanted to express in this film about sort of feeling the feeling of something big coming.、Um, and in order to express this,、uh, this feeling that something large or some monstrosity is coming,、uh, coming I really wanted to use sound. Um, in order to express that,、um, I wanted to think about what this protagonist might be afraid of in understanding that something large is looming.、Um, and so I used sound.、Um, and this film was made with the intention to be screened in a movie theater. 
So we constructed the sound to make sure that if it is played in a theater, there's a lot of vibrations that happen. So I wanted to use vibration as a way to also feel that monstrosity. Um, and in terms of your question about color, um, another big inspiration for this story um, had to do with the fact that I had been to Ishinomaki where um, the uh, tsunami disaster happened um, in Japan. And there I saw um, a, a sort of a ritualistic um, action of human beings taking apart a big giant whale. Um, and to see that happen in this uh, very tender manner where people were doing uh, were taking apart this whale through a rich through a ritual really made me um, it really inspired this film and so for that reason I really wanted an ocean feeling in the film um, and so because I was mainly shooting outside I would be using a daylight film but instead I ended up using a tungsten film um, and that resulted in giving the blue hue and um, expressing the ocean feel. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I hope your film uh, is able to screen in the cinema as soon as possible. In fact, I, I hope that for each of your films because I think that's really where they deserve to be seen. Um, uh, Sophia, I'll, I'll jump to you um, because Point in Line to Plane also I think responds to time in a really interesting way. Uh, it follows this that magical thinking, as, as you put it. Um, there's a, a kind of skipping happening between the main character, uh, or the main character's thoughts as she reacts to these external factors um, in her sort of routine. Um, could you could you maybe start by telling us how this film really started for you, or where how it took shape? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think there's a lot that corresponds um, in terms of um, the way Aya was describing her film and the way that she put it together and the way that she relates to her subject matter, which is really interesting, um, especially with vibrations, because it's something that Kandinsky talks a lot about um, in his book, Point of Mind to Plane. But uh, the the film really uh, has its origins with uh, Helma of Klint's exhibition uh, that was happening at the Guggenheim, um, which actually happened um, before my friend Jack's death. And it was a funny situation because I went to go see this exhibition, but I, I chose the wrong day to go and see it. So they were still installing it when I went. And there's something really funny to me about being held at an arm's length from the exhibition. It reminded me of my short film, Vessel Moy Song, um, that you programmed in 2018, where um, the protagonist, Audrey, is trying to get access to something, but is kind of like held at an arm's length. And I knew that when I was at the show that it was important um, and that I should capture it in some way. And I didn't know why. So I just started filming people installing uh, Helma Ofklin's exhibition. Um, and started to kind of piece together this little narrative in my mind. And then I went back to the show the next day um, and I was looking at um, the work and I started looking at these orbs that were intersecting in him off Clint's work. And I took a photograph and I sent it to my friend um, Rachel and I said, this reminds me of my neighbor Jan's blotting strips um, that we had filmed together where he had these orbs that had intersected. Five days later, Jan passed away um, suddenly. He had cancer, but he, he died um, a little bit quicker than um, anticipated. Um, and then another 10 days after that, my friend Jack passed away. Um, and for me, um, it was really striking kind of dealing with this sudden loss because I was trying to grasp at what had happened. And what was really strange that I discovered was that Jack passed away on Hilma Offklint's birthday. And he was actually in New York City at the same time that I was photographing that show. Um, I just didn't know that he was there and it was the last trip that he took before he died. So I was kind of looking at all these pieces and I was like, how does this make sense? How can I put all this together? And at his funeral, his sister said something that really kind of put it all together for me, which is that she said, people will forget what you said. They will forget uh, what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And I started to think about Kandinsky's paintings and how Jack and I had an affinity for his work. Um, and then realized that Hilma Off Klint was Kandinsky's predecessor. 
Um, and also um, started to make connections with um, how the Guggenheim was built and that it was, um, it started to be conceived by Frank Lloyd Wright the year actually that him off Clint passed away, which is in 1944, he started drawing spirals. So it was supposed to be this place that was built to showcase non-objective art. So it really started with this kind of, I guess, like flood of ideas that came from, I guess, trying to comprehend these two um, deaths that happened in my life very suddenly. And then it all kind of flowed out from there. Um, it, you know, you mentioned this connection to Vez Lemoyne's song, um, which also stars Derek Campbell. And I, I believe this is your, your fourth collaboration with her as, as, a, as, as, a work, as an actress, at least. Um, together, that's your fourth time, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm wondering if you can speak uh, maybe a little bit about your working relationship for this film, and um, mm. um, you know, in in some way, as she sort of sit, fits into this universe that you've made between these these films, and I, I'm wondering if you can also uh, sort of speak to that element of, of of sort of using Dara as as a kind of conduit um, for these feelings, mm. which evidently this film is is quite personal. Yeah, I mean, I'm really lucky to have the working relationship that I have um, with Dara because I think she was um, right there alongside me um, when this big event happened in my life. So I think for her as an actor, this was kind of like a, a next level embodiment in that I think she carried a lot of um, the sadness and the melancholy that she witnessed um, when she was with me and kind of embodied it in this performance. And it was kind of um, striking the way that she did that because um, she's not like a, a method actor where she kind of like accesses feelings and then embodies them. She tries to go with more of like a mood um, and she picks that up from her surroundings um, and from a lot of the literature that she reads to kind of craft a character. And um, for me, what was really interesting um, in this film, and we're talking a lot about, I guess, like time traveling. And as I was talking about, like, kind of the, this idea of being like a time traveling ghost, Dara was doing a lot of that in her performance when we were restaging all of these moments. So we spent about three or four days restaging all these moments where she was kind of like in this white gallery space or in her apartment. We don't really know where she is exactly because she's kind of like traveling through, I guess, thoughts in her mind, like her location is very ambiguous. But what was really interesting is I had collected all this footage throughout the course of the year. So I was in um, New York and I was in Iceland and I was in St. Petersburg and I collected it all together. And um, it came together in this letter that I wrote to my, um, grandmother and I had to show Dara the footage and I'd be like okay now you're in St. Petersburg and this is how you're reacting um, and she was really really clever I think at like crafting this palette of reactions in terms of how she was absorbing um, the footage and placing herself um, in time in terms of how her character should be reacting um, to it um, to things emotionally um, so it was really, I think, impressive the way I think that she threw herself into the project, but was so um, able, I think, to embody, I think, what I went through so um, succinctly. I'm, I'm not sure if I, I heard you right, but I, I mm -hmm. was meaning to ask you about um, ultimately how you did organize all of these, these different elements um, that were both internal and external. And did you say that it ultimately came through in, in a letter that you wrote? Yeah, so I just kind of, I experienced a series of strange coincidences that started um, with uh, the Guggenheim to realizing how um, Jack and I um, were connected uh, through Kandinsky. And all these things just kept happening and presenting themselves to me. Um, and um, yeah, it just, it kind of poured out in this letter that I wrote to my grandmother one day. Um, and it kind of like, it felt like this flood, which is really important because the painting composition six that um, I featured at the end of the film. And I just so happened um, the next year after Jack's passing, I, I so happened to be in St. Petersburg. Um, and it's a 
another funny coincidence because Kandinsky is from Russia. So I found myself at the Hermitage in front of his painting Composition 6, and I was reading about how Kandinsky made this painting, and he was trying to put it together, and he was totally blocked and his assistant said um you know just say the word flood to yourself over and over and over again and he did um and finally he kind of like exploded and was able to put the painting together in three days um and that's kind of how I felt like this film came together um I was just very much attracted to certain things um and shot them sometimes on my iPhone um and sometimes on 16 millimeter and to kind of merge those two formats I did like a lot of um screen transfers. So I, I shot um, a lot of the digital footage off the screen with my Bullock's camera to have like more of a uniform um, look. But I suppose the best way that I could describe it is that I just had a lot of these things that happened to me that I collected intuitively with whatever I had on hand and then tethered it together with this voiceover and then had um, Dara pick up all of these moments of restaging in between, which gives you the film, I guess, that you saw today. Thank you, Sophia. Um, on, the, on the topic of collaborations, uh, Jackie, I'll hop to you because uh, this is your your second time working with actress Sophia Coccoli, uh, who seems to be playing a similar character as, as the character in your previous short. Um, you did already mention in your earlier answer that you sort of see uh, End of Suffering as a sort of continuation of of films, um, but I, I'm just wondering if you can maybe speak more to that and, and also how Sophia sort of uh, fits into this. Uh. Yes. Uh, for sure, uh, I see somehow all of my films, even the earlier works, um, even the feature that I'm currently editing, um, as an open plan of um, examination of particular themes that somehow um, have affected me and interest me and I want to explore further on. Um, yes, and the end of suffering somehow happened before the feature and literally at a point where I, with myself, ha has, has felt a fed up situation. I was done with many, many um, hardcore situations and uh, I thought that this will be the end. Um, and I tried to create somehow a black comedy instead of again approaching themes with a particular um, severity and seriousness. Um, yes, and you know it's weird because many people think that it's a very unique film, very different from the rest. And I think they stay on the format of it and not on the content because I think the content if literally you take the texts, they're very, very similar to each other. It's again, belonging or not belonging. The reason why I'm suffering, what, what does it mean that I suffer? What does it mean not to feel connected and want to, not to feel loved? Uh, not to be sure about the boundaries between real and non-real. So yes, um, the vehicle has changed, however, the message it's, a, it's similar. Um, and about Sophia, yes, after Hector Malo, um, I think I cannot work and I don't want to work with any other um, female actor. Um, she has become a very, very special friend for me as well. And um, yes, and in the feature also to the protagonist. And the feature protagonist, once you watch it, is again a continuation of this character, this Sophia character. Um, I think I could not work with anyone else because somehow, although in the actual film, it's mostly her voice acting and mm -hmm. asking stuff and, you know, being in this dreamy, crazy space. Um, at the beginning, the scene at the bus, it's somehow um, a dialogue between, this scene is a dialogue between the other scene at the church in Hector Mala where she's listening to music and she's crying again. So it's somehow, to parallel stuff. Um, yes, I think that everything we do as, as filmmakers, as artists, um, it's one. I really believe in that. I think that we all try to figure out um, something very particular that 
we find in ourselves and it usually is the same and we just try to you know it's like stepping in different shoes but the route is similar and i hope that uh, i will reach at some point at some point you know the solution or the answer um well i i, I actually would like to turn to you know the the different shoes as you, as you put it or the the different vehicle for this film um i i'm curious how you ultimately decided that this this style of interview format was was the right way to proceed with uh, with these ideas. Yes, I knew from the beginning uh, because it's a it's a real story that I had uh, a very weird experience with uh, a very red star that I saw in the sky, and then I found out that indeed is Mars. So this is a fact, and it happened, and I was out of my mind. Uh, so I knew <laughs> that I wanted to create a weird dialogue where we were not sure whether the other part is a universe, is God, is a planet, is in her head, is her internal voice, we don't know. Okay, so I really knew that I wanted to leave it out there, like not, it doesn't even have a voice, it's like a weird sound that we have created, because I don't even want to characterize it by gender. Is it a woman, is it a man, is it a child? I don't, I don't care, it's just, you know, sometimes when you are alone at home and you're thinking, if you observe um, closely the thought, there is always a voice, but it's not really a voice. Okay, I hope I'm not. I don't sound super cuckoo now, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, you're thinking stuff. You're thinking you have thoughts, 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 and you stop at some point, and you're like, okay, where? What did I just think of now? Where did that come from? And when you try to catch it again, there's always some, some kind of voice that is not really a voice. So anyway, I tried to imitate my experience with me talking to myself inside my head, uh, at least for the moment. And um, this is how we came up with it. Yes, I don't know if it works because some people are confused with the, the non-voice part and the sound. But I think that... Um, Somehow it adds up to the experience, and I, I like it. I like it too. I think it works quite well. Uh, um, I, I have another question for you that I would also like to um, extend to Graham, uh, which is I, th I find that both of your films have, to a degree, a sci-fi element at play. and. Um, I'm curious if this was a, a genre that was sort of directly on your mind as you were making the film. Um, if there were, if you were looking to specific science fiction um, or, or perhaps even fantasy or a genre filmmakers uh, in particular for, for visual or, or aural uh, inspiration. Uh, personally, no, not at all. Um, I, I watched a lot of, uh, very old school Russian documentaries. Because of what I wanted to do, somehow, yes, it was a purpose to create a science fiction. I call it black comedy science fiction art house film because I think the fact that in the film, the universe all of the time keeps repeating, stop labeling, stop categorizing, stop it with the labeling stuff. I want to make a film that in itself, as a film, you could not really say, ah, oh, a comedy, black comedy, thriller. So I want to have a multi-genre film. However, I researched a lot. And that's why we, we chose the 16 millimeter format to have this grainy and somehow all oldish look. Uh, and we, we didn't clear out the hair and the gate, if you see, it's really messy. Because I want to imitate this uh, old school, old school Soviet documentaries uh, which I love aesthetically, and at the same time, it suits with the film by creating a pseudo documentary of planet Mars, like how we big we went for Mars with all cameras for a day. Uh, this was the whole uh, concept. I think I think I can totally relate to what uh, Jacqueline is saying about uh, like I wasn't really thinking that much about science fiction or science fiction uh, movies in particular, I was actually thinking, I think, more about documentaries and specifically observational filmmaking. 
And I think that the science fiction element was sort of more of a way uh, or like a frame for, for me to sort of view uh, the world and, and specifically, I think like my environment. It's kind of a personal film in a way because I think uh, I wanted to work in a, in a much more um, small scale and tangible way. So a lot of the film was shot um, with just me and my, my partner Daiba um, and producing partner Dan uh, with the 35 millimeter camera, which is quite a big camera in a wagon, just sort of exploring uh, my neighborhood and places that I often frequent. And so I guess like the sci-fi element was a way of looking at these places that I was quite familiar with in a totally new way. And, um, but yeah, I think in terms of science fiction films that, that are maybe somewhat, somewhat, uh, inspired some of the ideas in here. I feel like Close Encounters in a bizarre way because I've always kind of looked up to that film or the ideas in that film that instead of, you know, the, the aliens coming to earth to destroy to destroy us, uh, they, they come to earth and, and like jam and make music. And I, and I feel like there, there's something about, um, or something that, that subconsciously maybe informed uh, this choice to have a, a Lin, Leonard Nimoy song play at the end. He, he's he's like the alien in in, in Star Trek to ha have like Leonard Nimoy uh, play play this like uplifting music at the end of the, the film. Maybe it's not an end. It's 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 a beginning. Yeah, uh, that's how I I saw it. Yeah, I I, I I mean I sort of thought about science fiction with your film for for a few things, but but especially the the way you used music um, there, I mean, of course, I, the, the Leonard Nimoy uh, track stood out to me um, in terms of sci-fi, but yeah, as you mentioned, um, Close Encounters right now, uh, I think that also, that, that film shares a lot with yours in terms of how you both have used m music. I, I think you use music quite dramatically in this film and in the, in the same way that uh, maybe a, a John Williams score sort of functions in, in a Spielberg film. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit curious if you can talk more about the role of music in your film, perhaps as a, as a kind of uh, driving force for the story. Totally. I feel, yeah, I feel like that, that introduction of the film, um, I sort of felt interested. In, I was thinking a lot about, or maybe to start with like the, the film as a whole, I was kind of this this observational approach was also inspired by like uh, street photography or uh, plein air painting this idea that you you could kind of go out into the world and and see the the magic in in these like small sort of un, unseen places without thinking about or with, without having like a preconceived idea i guess of like what you're going to paint or what you're going to take a photo of or whatever so so i i thought that uh setting up I guess the rules of the world of the film with a, a painting um, was kind of an interesting way to sort of um, uh, speak to that uh, visually at the beginning and I, and I worked with this amazing painter a good friend of mine Darby Milbrath uh, who who composed this image um, specifically for this project and she didn't see any of the footage for the film before she painted it, but we talked at length sort of about the idea of this world and, and how it parallels our own um, and all these things. And so the painting is almost kind of a record of her performance as like the, an artist uh, in this world. So it, 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 might, it might even be kind of one of the only performances in the film or directed performances in the film. Um, and, and so, I, when I saw the painting, I sort of felt music. And Darby, uh, she paints with, with, with a lot of dramatic music when she makes her work. And so it kind of felt right, like the, the painting kind of almost felt like uh, uh, a piece of music or something to me. So I kind of wanted to both, I think also kind of manipulate the, the like feeling of, of the narration that was, that was also, or the voiceover that was playing over top. Um, try to kind of create this, this epic feeling, this epic like introduction 
to what is really a film about kind of pretty regular everyday moments. I thought there was like a kind of a funny contradiction to that, but also something that was that was interesting to you to kind of create these these like larger than life stakes. Um, and so the music I thought was um, was helpful, I guess, in articulating that. It's an interesting effect. Um, when when did you shoot the film? We shot the film sort of over the course of many months, uh, starting in July 2019. And then I think we finished shooting uh, November 2019, I think. Huh. But we kind of shot very intermittently. And some, some of the shooting days were, as you could prob probably tell from the last shot, much like larger than others or in terms of the crew and the, the process involved. Yeah, I'm well. I'm, knowing knowing that uh, when you sort of wrapped the film, I'm curious what how, sort of how you you know watching it today, like how, if you feel any differently watching it because you know um, I watched the film under you know these sort of circumstances right now, and I think uh, I think your film in particular in particular really uh, sort of resonates with the kind of ambient apocalyptic. Um, thinking yeah. many of us are kind of uh, working through at the moment. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if if you if you feel differently about your film these days. It has definitely made me think about it in in, in many different ways. But I, I think um, on reflection, the the film I think it was kind of originally inspired maybe kind of like uh in the same vein of what Aya was speaking about um sort of inspired by these these like very difficult to contemplate or or um, process existential threats that we face uh as we sort of enter this new era of the climate crisis and and, and these sort of natural disasters um so that was kind of i think a, a big part of the sort of initial impetus of the film um, but I was listening to uh, Garrett Bradley talk about her, her documentary um, time that you guys are screening and and she said something something about how um, these these ideas that are presented in her film are, are were kind of always there uh, or always have have been there even though we've kind of gone through a very uh, rapid uh, process of, of change sort of in, in in light of the, the themes within her work, I sort of feel the same way, that even though the pandemic is a, um, a totally different threat, I, I do feel like that those things were kind of always always there. Um, and, and, and they just kind of take different forms or different shapes. But I feel like these things are, are more connected than, than I think I originally thought. So maybe that's, that's sort of the new way that, that I look at the film now. Thanks, Graham. Um, Lan, I'll, I'd like to finally turn to you. Uh, um, you know, I, I was really struck by, um, I mean, I'm struck by your cinematography uh, throughout your work, um, and, and this film is, is no different. Uh, you know, um, how you capture a location, but also how you stage your actors within them is, is really an accomplishment, I think. Um, there's a very careful choreography at work. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, so I'm just wondering if you can maybe talk about um, how you think about um, your actors in relation to location or, or maybe vice versa. So um, actually, um, we first with the actors and actress, then uh, when I decide to, to, to write the film, then actually I start to write the dialogue first. And I, I think that I will work with uh, the actor and actress I know really well. So uh, actually, um, when, when I decide that, then um, when I do writing, the, then I, I really know it. I think that I could imagine like how they can react with uh, the dialogues and then the actions there. But um, and then after I finish all the script and the writing, then I spend a lot of time in the location just to like um, both um, like to change the script and then on to to find the place that uh, I think I should um, uh, place the camera. Then then I, I just 
I mean, it just happened like that. But because uh, before that, I, I haven't uh, studied in uh, film school. So what I um, try to plan for the shooting is, uh, and do not try to plan uh, to, to shoot like master shoot and then close up and things. But I just uh, try to like um, step by step, like uh, after this shot and what should be in the next shot and then things. Like how we write uh, poem or music, it seems like that. So it's, it's kind of really in nature. Mm. Um, you, so you, you mentioned um, after your writing process, after you write the script, you go to this location and, and you mentioned that you, you change based on the location. Um, could, uh, I'm curious what, what might have changed for you with this film once you were on location? Uh, so uh, when I do writing, then actually uh, I also think that if um, uh, the actor and actress react to, to uh, like how, when they act, then how, how they move and uh, if it's just uh, like um, in, in um, like in a very ideal place, and then but when I go to the location, then I just think more about like how the camera how the camera will traveling that. Um, but uh, actually, um, uh, um, uh, when um, um, I mean, um, after all of that, then when we do, we go to the shooting. Then because uh, we shoot uh, near the river, so that uh, sometimes the tide go up and down. I mean, it's not really it, it's really something that I uh, could not uh, expect at the time. So uh, actually, we at the end, then we, we have to change the plan. Usually, like uh, for, for example, at first when um, uh, uh, around it was around like the June or July of last year when I uh, came to the location to change the script, then the um, the, the uh, rivers the water level is very low. But uh, when uh, around the October when they come there, then it, uh, the, the water it eats all the rocks and things there, and we have to find another location, and then I, I still have to like pause the crew a little bit and then have to plan again. So it was quite. Um, on the on the on the topic of of your writing and or the general structure of your film, um, you know, we we're sort of paralleling these two stories of the of the of the two couples. Um, and you're using a cross cutting, uh, cross cutting throughout the film. Uh, and I'm, I, I guess I'm curious if, if that technique uh, emerged that uh, in the editing, or if that was something that you had formed already in the uh, in the script, or, or if it was actually something that that you changed uh, while shooting. Mm. Uh, I think that with this film, then around like uh, seventy five or eighty percent that we planned before. But uh, during the, um, the, the shooting then, because uh, in the film then we work with uh, animals and sometimes that, uh, um, it has rain that we did not expect it and we have to stop the crew and then we, we could not have enough money to like extend the days so that um, uh, some uh, shooting is not really as we planned before then uh, I think especially for the um, beginning of the film then we have to, 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 to like just like um, Play and then uh, like see, we have to deal with that now uh, uh, in the editing process. So, yeah. Um, you you sort of touched on the way you write um, for certain actors, but I, I I guess I'm wondering particularly about the younger couple in the film um, because uh, they're also musicians who who have performed this. I actually don't know if they're performing this track that we hear that's, um, I guess, orchestrated a bit differently or arranged differently throughout the film, but I, I think they're at least performing the version at the end. And I'm wondering, well, I guess, were, the, were they cast based on, on them being musicians or was there something else at work here? Uh, uh, for we and now we the cover, yes. Then actually, I met them like uh, two years ago, uh, two years before the film shooting. Just like uh, want to know them because uh, sometimes uh, at the time they was very young, and then they have some songs that I really think that my works in some of my film in the future. So I and when I met them, then I think that they are very talented, and they can also can also do acting very well. 
So I, at that time, I had intended to, to have them in my films. Uh, so with this film, then, um, because uh, the money is not really like the big uh, money, so when I, I intend to, 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 to work with uh, the actor and actress that I know, and then I also want to like, maybe use something that they had before, like just uh, the, their costume or even the, um, uh, their songs, I, um, even like um, both in the way that we, I can have, I can use it, and or I have to reuse it. So, in the film, then um, for the sound and then the music, I, I was um, planning with my um, sound designer and my um, music composer that uh, uh, we just only need to keep the feeling of the river. That even when we see or we haven't seen it, but we really need to feel that it flowed through the all of the film. So uh, with that, then my music composer, he, when he, me and him, we listened to all the songs that the couple have. And then uh, we realized that with uh, this sound that we can only change the instrument, then it can make the very strong feeling of the film. So yeah, that, that was the way that we played. Um, I just, I just have one more question. Um, which is something that you um, you you touched on at the start that this film is part of uh, a larger project about uh, Mekong River. Mm -hmm. um, I, so could you maybe talk a bit more about about what this project is uh, and sort of how you see your film fitting into it? Is it an omnibus film? I guess it's an omnibus film. So uh, that uh, omnibus, it was um, uh, it uh, started by. Uh, I, uh, the Luang Prabang Film Festival. It was um, it, it is a festival in Laos. So during uh, the early of uh, uh, last year, then uh, one of my documentary filmmakers, yes, yeah, she introduced me to to, to the fest that festival, and then uh, we know that uh, that festival one I have got the budget, and then they want to make us. Uh, an omnibus about the Mekong. Because um, right now in Vietnam, then, um, I mean, throughout all the Southeast Asia, then that was, uh, that, uh, the river, this river is uh, one of the biggest and the most important river in, in this area. And actually it flows through the uh, six or seven countries, like from Tibet to China, and then to Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, but uh, so, so the, um, so, so the festival one, like us, like five filmmakers from uh, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, each uh, filmmaker uh, will make a short film about the river in their whole country. So that, that was the start mm -hmm. project. And uh, the way that they do is like, uh, I think it's a bit uh, unique because uh, the money came from the, like uh, some of very large and, uh, NGOs, of the Southeast Asia. Yeah, it, it was not really like a very huge uh, funding thing. So uh, um, uh, um, uh, during the early of, of uh, last year, then um, they wanted, uh, they, they fly uh, all of us to one place and then we have to um, uh, hear the, uh, we had to hear the, uh, um, about the importance of the river and things, and then you have to make the uh, inner course. Like, uh, then the uh, some people there, then they will introduce like how to, like they do uh, how do I say they they gave, gave us uh, the material and the document about the river. But then based on that, then we create our stories. You know, you, you said you were given um, documents about the river um, as part of this project, right? Um, or you were sort of taught or educated about the river in, to some extent before beginning your project. But I, I'm curious, you know, like what sort of notions you had about the river, what your kind of relationship to it was before uh, starting on this project. I guess so. Uh, with uh, the uh, part of the Mekong River that flows to Vietnam, then I realized that. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of, because Vietnam is a um, uh, country that, uh, I mean, the last country, I mean, after Vietnam, then the river will flow to the sea. So actually, it, uh, um, 
uh, there's a lot of the countries um, before that they, they had the dam in the hydroelectric power plant and then mm-hmm. afflict, the effects to a lot of the cities in, uh, like in Vietnam. Uh, so I think maybe some of the the, 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 the things that should play in, in it, that it should relate to, to the hydroelectric power plants things. But uh, when I think about the hydroelectric power plant, then I do not really want to think about the social aspect of that. I really want to, to like think about something like a bit, uh, like maybe a metaphor for the for, for, uh, of that. Like uh, maybe because um, like the rivers seems like always be compared with the flow of the times. Then somehow we when we see about the uh, uh, we see like uh, if we are in, in the big city and then uh, we go uh, um, upstream to the hydro power plant. It seems like we go to the past and then. Uh, it's a place that changed the river. It's also like the place that changed our currents of time like forever. So that's uh, the that start. That and about the second uh, storylines is um, um, uh, because I any mean, whole of the seven, six or seven countries that the Mekong uh, go through, it's affected by uh, the Buddhism, by, by the spirit of the Buddhism very much. So actually, I still think that maybe should be in the interview. So, and uh, um, I mean, uh, during that time, of, uh, so my friend introduced me to the book of Herman Hesse, the um, Sitatra. Sitatra. Herman Hesse is um, a writer, a German writer who had Nobel Prize. Yet, so he wrote a book about Sitatra that the, it's about a man who, um, who, who lived in the the, the age of the Buddhist, the, the Buddha, and then he also trying to find. Uh, he also trying to find a way how to like uh, how to say uh, like um, to realize the something big in, in his life. So uh, in in that yeah. So I mean all of that didn't make me to, to have the idea. Thank you, Len. Uh, thanks to you all for for joining today and uh, for your wonderful films and and answers. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having us and for putting together this extraordinarily thoughtful program. It's been wonderful hearing everyone's um, answers and their thought process behind their films. So thank you so much for having us. It's such an honor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, and I hope to meet you in person someday. Hi. Hi, Lam. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I hope to see you all in person sooner rather than later. <laughs> but, but yes, all right, until then, um, thanks again to our viewers for joining us at the New York Film Festival, and uh, I guess we'll see you, see you next time. <laughs>